Okay. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining the weekly robotics meetup. Today we have uh, Roland who will talk about perception for autonomous cars. Uh, thanks for joining Roland. Uh, as always, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, uh, feel free to start whenever you are ready. All right. Hey, thanks. Uh, yeah. So my name is Roland Mietens. I'm uh, currently a product manager at Amatel. Uh, and in the past, I've been working at Autonomous Intelligent Driving and Argo AI on uh, self-driving cars. So I wanted to basically go a bit through the real basics of autonomous vehicles. Uh, so that's the uh, five levels of driving automation, uh, what kind of sensors are used for self-driving cars, uh, what kind of the architectures are in terms of what components are there in, in the self-driving car stack, uh, and then go over four really basic methods for object detection for autonomous vehicles. Uh, and then I figured that we could do something interactive. So normally if you are doing a meetup, it's just you listen to some guy talking and then I don't know, after, after half an hour, I start being distracted and start doing something else. So I figured that after uh, half an hour, we can do like an intermezzo and can have a bit of a discussion on what you as a participant in the meetup uh, think is important uh, for uh, the safety certification on self-driving vehicles, right? So if you want to, uh, I don't know, import a toy into the EU, you have to show that it's uh, not poisonous for children. So if we have self-driving cars, what do you as a consumer or a person on the streets uh, want to see uh, has been certified about this car before we allow it on the street? Um, so if you can already start thinking about that, that would be great, uh, or be prepared to turn on your webcam and your microphone uh, so we can, uh, we can have this discussion, that would be nice. Uh, and after we do that, I will tell a bit more about kind of the data required to train self-driving cars and the importance of high quality data for training and uh, validation. So we will come back there to proposals you made during this intermezzo. Uh, and then at the end, I'll have a short uh, yeah, talk about uh, why self-driving cars need to be able to adapt to self-driving situations or to new situations. Um, yeah. So the first thing is actually really exciting because uh, there's different types of self-driving cars. So often in the media, everyone talks about self-driving cars if it's one thing, uh, but actually there's multiple challenges. And this has been changed last week. Uh, so last week they defined the levels of self-driving vehicles a bit better, but there's a big difference between uh, the self-driving level zero, uh, which is uh, no, no uh, support at all for your self-driving, uh, for your car, uh, all the way to level five, which means you have a self-driving car, which completely drives itself. You're not needed anymore. Um, it can drive whenever uh, and everywhere. And uh, there's a big, maybe important split here between level two, where there is uh, support for steering and braking and acceleration, everything. Um, such as, for example, keeping the car in the center of the lane or adaptive cruise control. But it's really important that uh, in level two, you, as in if you buy the car and you're driving this, you are still driving and you are still responsible and you are still, um, you have still have to make sure that the car is uh, safe. Uh, you must constantly kind of supervise it. You have to keep a look at, okay, what's, what's the car doing? Um, and then there's level three from where you're not responsible anymore. Uh, you can go read a book, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the difference between level three self-driving where you're maybe not driving anymore, but uh, sometimes the car might say, uh, oh, I don't know what to do anymore. Uh, and then you must take over. Um, so in level three and four, there are basically limited conditions and limited circumstances uh, in which a car can drive. So think about a limited, uh, uh, limited to specific highways or uh, limited to uh, the traffic jam, for example. Um, and in level four, uh, there's already never any moment where you have to intervene with the car and get in the car or uh, get behind the steering wheel to take over. Um, so. 
after we hear this, I've got a quiz. Uh, yeah, okay, I can control my slides, it's good. So uh, for the people who are listening, what level of driving automation do you think the following, car, uh, following cars have or want to have? Uh, so let's uh, first start with uh, Tesla. Uh, Elon Musk says, uh, always says, uh, says full self-driving capabilities. That's what they sell in the media. Uh, what level do you think a Tesla has? Should we use chat for this or um, do we want to? Oh, what we can do is, uh, I don't know, if, do people mind turning the webcam on or is it like super awkward now? Are people like sending in the pajamas? Uh, <laughs> Uh, don't know. I can allow everybody to unmute themselves if you want. It's up to you. Yeah. What we can do, it's also hard. Like I'm trying to get a good view on everybody, but I'm tr struggling with my window. Ah, now I got it. I can actually see people. Great. Okay. Also, the, the, my screen with people is on my right, my webcam. So I look like I'm looking away. <laughs> uh, so what we can do is do uh, finger voting. So uh, people you can just show, I mean, there's five levels. There's uh, five fingers. It's easy, right? So people can just show their fists and then we just count down uh, uh, three, two, one, and then you show what level you think a Tesla has. Three, two, one. I see two times two, I see two. three. All right, so the right answer is indeed uh, two. So the Tesla uh, has uh, supports uh, steering and uh, braking acceleration, but uh, there's never a moment in a Tesla right now that you can, um, look away or uh, take your eyes off the road or start reading a book. Um, so you always have to uh, be uh, invested in driving. But if we go to the next, uh, to the next uh, car, uh, there's Audi A8. And the Audi A8, when it was released, they said this car will have uh, a traffic jam pilot. Uh, and if you get into a traffic jam, the car will steer itself and you can just relax. And as soon as you get out of the truck jam, the car will beep and you have to take over again. Uh, what, uh, what level do you think? Uh, let's do the same uh, uh, thumb, finger, hand voting again. Uh, three, two, one. I see one, two, and two. Yeah, no, so actually in this case, it's a bit awkward for Audi because the, I think the feature never released, but the plan was what they wanted to have was a level three system where they where you would really drive into the traffic jam and the control would start showing movies or something. You didn't have to pay any attention at all. Um, but that's really this really local thing where uh, where Audi would basically be responsible for any accident. Um, car would be responsible. And then we've got the, the Waymo vehicle. You already see there's no driver behind the steering wheel. So that's a hint. Uh, <laughs> what level do you think the uh, Waymo vehicles have? Uh, Let's uh, count down again. Three, two, one. I see level three, 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 and four. So the right answer is that Waymo is uh, level four. So uh, Waymo is really going for a fully autonomous vehicle, which is only at uh, only like a local driverless taxi. I don't know if you can see my cursor, by the way. But uh, so it's only a local driverless taxi, but you as a passenger uh, will never have to take over the steering wheel. The car should be able to handle that all himself. Um, so those are levels. Uh, so now the problem or the challenge with autonomous driving. So people always say, oh, there's so many accidents in traffic, which is true. And it's, uh, it's really terrible. Um, but it's a really hard problem to automate, even though humans are not amazing at driving. Uh, human controlled driving is really safe. So maybe, uh, maybe mute again, by the way. I'm hearing some uh, <laughs> rustling. So in the United States, there's uh, maybe one death for every 100 million miles driven. So that means that there's one uh, accident or one accident with a death be um, um, ending for every 114 years of driving or every 10 to the power six hours. Um, as a fun fact, by the way, if you guys are able to fly a plane again, uh, a plane is a thousand times more uh, or yeah, kind of like safe against uh, wings falling off. So. Every 114,000 years uh, of flying, a plane loses its wings spontaneously. Uh, 
but this is kind of the the safety we're we're looking at for transport which is really safe uh, if you look back at programs you've written yourself uh it happens pretty yeah like th this is kind of safety you really have to uh, get to uh, so for the sensors self-driving cars have i already showed you the waymo vehicle here uh, so the sensors self-driving cars have to determine where can i drive what's what decisions can i make um, those are uh, lidars which you can see here uh, cameras which are all around the vehicle and radars um, so I want to quickly go over, especially nowadays that people are saying, oh, Elon Musk is saying, oh, there's no need for uh, LiDAR or there's no need for radar. Every one of these sensors actually has big uh, merits and reasons you want to use them. So LiDARs are really great because they have really accurate distance estimates. Um, so those are centimeter accurate. Uh, you know exactly where objects are around you. Um, it's a really nice sensor for that. But there's also a downside. So, for example, if you have non-reflective objects like really black cars or outer reflective objects like traffic signs, um, they tend to cause a bit of blooming or um, non-reflective objects don't return any LiDAR information. So then you don't see your specific object anymore. And LiDARs are also extremely expensive. But you can see that Waymo likes LiDAR so much that they've put one big spinning one for long range uh, LiDAR in the middle. So this will sends up to 200 or 250 meters away. And they also added one, two, three, four uh, LiDARs on the side to catch any pedestrians or any small uh, things which are closer to the car. So they have complete 360 degree coverage of their car. Um, they've also got radar, uh, sorry, cameras. Um, so if you look at a laser scanner, it like those lighters are always spinning, right? So that means that you only shoot a laser beam every X angle, um, but it means that farther away, you don't have that many lighter returns anymore for objects. So if you have an object, which is maybe 200 or 150 meters away, there's maybe, I don't know, eight or five or 10 uh, lighter points you get back from the object and you don't really know what it is. So uh, cameras are really useful because you get really dense data also further away. You can see that Waymo here has two uh, far range cameras uh, in front of a vehicle. Uh, so that's really useful. Um, there's also many known algorithms for image processing. Uh, those images are uh, laid out really nice so the convolutional deep learning uh, algorithms can handle them really well. Uh, there's tons of research which uh, where self-driving cars are currently benefiting from, which are not in the domain of um, self-driving at all or robotics at all. But because people are solving the image net challenge, for example, <clears throat> we get way better ideas of what to do for our robotics project. Um, so that's a big benefit of camera. Uh, but then the big problem with cameras is that there's no accurate distance estimates. Of course, we as humans can uh, can say, oh, this is probably farther away than that, but it's not a measurement. It keeps being an estimate. Uh, so that's hard if you want to have uh, information you really can act on with your robot or with your self-driving car. And then there are is the radar. Uh, so you can imagine that if there is uh, snow or if it is raining very hard or if it is uh, foggy, then you can't, like there's no light penetrating <laughs> through the fog or the rain, right? Uh, or maybe not a lot. So in these cases, LiDAR has some troubles or reflects of like small wet surfaces. Um, and for example, LiDAR can't go through fog. And of course, cameras also can't go through fog. Um, but radars, they can. So if you have bad weather circumstances, your radar still works in bad weather conditions. It also gives you something really cool, which is radio velocity. So velocity of other participants in the direction of the vehicle. Uh, but the data itself is kind of sparse. So there's not that many radar returns and there's a bit of noisy data. Uh, so in that sense, it's less useful. But yeah, you can see that all of these sensors all together give a big... Um, like give a big good 360 degree view of what's going on in the world. 
Um, and one other camera, which is pretty cool for, for uh, robotics, uh, which is not on the Waymo cars, but I figured that you guys might like it, is a thermal camera. So thermal cameras really give you a estimate of the temperature of objects. And you can imagine that if you have a robot deployed, for example, in a dark environment uh, with normal cameras, that might be a problem. But humans are always roughly the same temperature. So they always stand out against uh, a specific background. So if you're ever building a robot, which also has to maybe drive at night or detect pedestrians at night, um, maybe think about a thermal camera because it's a nice additional way of perceiving objects. Um, so if you now look at uh, how we, so we now know kind of what sensor data we're getting into a self-driving car or a robot, right? So now the question is, how do you go from these sensors to actuation? And I want to here again, kind of highlight a bit of a difference between the uh, level four robot taxis and the level two uh, Tesla and maybe Coma AI, where you see that um, a lot of those robot taxi companies have a certain architecture, which is really modular. So they've got cameras and LIDARs, and then there's often components for doing object detection based on camera data. And then there's a component which does object detection based on LIDAR data. And you've got your uh, localization algorithm, which takes LIDAR and maybe GPS input. Um, and then you've got, because you've got different methods for object detection, there's also a component which does the object and center fusion, which takes it into account. And then you've got a separate maybe prediction team, which takes all this information and says, okay, well, what are people probably going to do? And all this information is then passed to a path planning component. Um, so it's really like a way more like architecture. And then people always talk about a, yeah, like a Tesla uh, like architecture. It's really easy to get started with end to end learning nowadays. So many people uh, are thinking, oh, why don't I just take my camera data and pass that directly to a path planning uh, component with a neural network? Uh, and also, um, Tesla is always talking about their Hydra nets. So they have um, as inputs the cameras, and then they have all kinds of outputs they can uh, use as like proxies. So they have object detection, uh, they're training that, and to get on the same neural network backbone, they've also do the object detection, or sorry, uh, the localization um, with respect to lanes, and then also in the uh, applied on the same uh, latent neural space, they can do maybe center fusion where they fuse all the camera information. They also do a prediction and they kind of directly uh, do the path planning uh, based on the same information. And that's a, that's a big difference uh, between end to end learning and, um, and this whole uh, kind of modular approach. Um, so, yeah. What I want to do is go over uh, four challenges of self-driving, which you are seeing often. Um, so there's a couple of tasks which people are trying to solve. There's many competitions for this. So if you are interested, download the data set, get started. It's loads of fun. One of them, which is very well now known nowadays, is bounding box detection, where people draw a box around each object and indicate what object it is. Um, so you're not only doing a classification task, like is there a pedestrian in this image, but you're also doing a uh, saying, okay, where exactly is this pedestrian? How big is it? How wide is it? So you can imagine that if you have a, a car or a robot and you have this information, you can already kind of try to navigate between the bounding boxes. Uh, it's, uh, it's still a bit hard uh, because if you know where something is, you don't know, or you don't know what or the thing which doesn't have a bounding box is. Uh, but there's a task for that, which is called semantic segmentation. And that's already more interesting because then the neural network or whatever algorithm you have has to indicate for each pixel what class it belongs to. So then you're already doing a very dense prediction. Uh, so if you have your input image, you're really saying, okay, this pixel, this is a pedestrian, uh, this pixel, this is the road, this pixel, this is a uh, lamppost, for example, or this pixel, this is a building. Um, you can already imagine that this is way easier to navigate through where you can at least have a feeling for uh, that you're trying to keep being on the road. Um, and then there's a task for tree bounding box detection. So then you're not only saying, okay, where is this object in the image, but you really say, okay, where is this in the world? Uh, give me the 3D coordinates. 
so this is normally where people start using LIDAR because it gives you a way more accurate uh, prediction of where an object is. Um, and often you're also trying to estimate the angle the object has and maybe the direction the object has so that you have an idea for where the car might go. So that's important for your prediction component. Uh, you're trying to estimate the size and yeah, a self-driving car algorithm of course needs this information because then it can predict where objects are, where they are going, you can, uh, you can track them. Um, so this is a really important and difficult task uh, where LiDAR starts being the main uh, input for your algorithm. And then there's another really cool uh, algorithm. I hope you can see this, but that's the 3D LiDAR segmentation. So if you have a LiDAR, you got all your points uh, in your point cloud for your laser distance returns. Um, the challenge for your algorithm is really indicate for each point what class it belongs to. So you can see that here in this case, uh, the challenge is okay, well, this, these points here belong to a pedestrian, these points here belong to a tree, all these points here belong to the road, here is where the sidewalk starts. Uh, so it's an even harder task, uh, but it's kind of, kind of new, like people started doing this since a couple of years. Um, I think there's still a lot of growth possibility to improve these algorithms here. Um, so now that we know what kind of uh, tasks they are and what kind of levels they are, I figured that um, you uh, as robotics experts might have a good idea for what you would like to see uh, for the safety certification of a self-driving car. And I figured we could maybe have a couple of proposals. I will write them down on the slides. And then at the end, um, we have a couple of nice, interesting proposals. We can have a bit of discussion. And after we do that, later I will tell a bit more about uh, some aspects of the data, uh, which might be interesting there. So uh, don't be shy. Do people have any proposals uh, or ideas for how you would safety certify a car? So um, I think there's two approaches you can take in general to this. So one is just um, having a drive, uh, ex having a drive for basically the statistical way, just um, having a drive a really long distance and have cover lots of different uh, roads and some situations. But the other one, the other one is analyzing this and. Uh, covering um, more on the software side, what types of stuff can uh, more? Uh, it's not really formal methods, but um, can you prove that it handles these and these cases, uh, which are two completely different ways? But I'm not sure which I um, which I which I would prefer before I step into a car like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So what I'm hearing here is that you say, okay, well, one way is that we can have a fleet and we drive it a really long distance and we make it cover loads of roads and kind of make sure it gets into different situations. And the other way is, okay, maybe we can have a certain set of like test cases and we just replay them. Or would you, how would you, how would you prove that it handles a certain set of cases? How would you do that? Um... No idea, really. <laughs> um, no, I, I really wouldn't know. So that's that, that's the problem there. And there's always uh, there's always more cases that you didn't think about, uh, and that goes for both situations for for both these types of certifications. I mean, you cannot drive in every situation, every uh, road, and you also cannot make a unit test, for example, for every case. That's uh, Quite we'll just write down the unit test for a fixed set of cases, and yeah, then we at least got those covered, right? But it's not going to be enough. <laughs> also, it's the same for integration tests. It's there's so yeah, you're dealing with human lives here. So I, I'm I'm not, I also don't not sure how, uh, for example, um, airplanes software for airplanes is, is certified, or same for. Um, medical devices that, that, that but then I, I'm not even sure how that type of certification actually works. 
we have any ID, uh, or maybe any any ideas of things which we are doing in the airplane and space flight industry which at least help make an airplane safer yeah there's well um there is different um standards you have to buy to like the for automotive there's uh misra c i think this automotive coding standards so that's one thing i know nasa has um, extensive code reviews and architecture that kind of stuff um i think even in nasa there's like two teams one team actually implementing stuff and the other team trying to break it so there's but that's like just general uh code review and qa testing um but yeah uh, but for stuff like computer vision and neural nets that's almost impossible to to have it adhere to any form of method. So there you get get to the statistics. Um, yeah, so that's not so sure. I don't know. It's yeah, difficult, I think that's it's for great. sure. Maybe anyone else has any uh, uh, things they know about the airplane and rocket industry where they, uh, which they do use to make sure that rockets and uh, airplanes are safe? I don't have extensive knowledge, but uh, I know that you have some guarantees on some sensors. Uh, so you have guarantees uh, both on sensors and uh, some on the hardware and software execution. So you can have hard deadlines that you need to meet at all, uh, yeah, at all times. Uh, and also, I would add uh, redundancy uh, as well. Uh, so you can have redundancy both in software and hardware. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I think and the redundancy. Is, I would... Yeah, go on. I think the redundancy is indeed an interesting, uh, interesting thing, right? So I know that um, rockets often have multiple uh, multiple flight computers where you see, okay, well, do they do they agree with each other? So you also mm -hmm. see in automotive uh, driving, there are some companies who have uh, two computers. And um, for example, AutoX, Chinese company, they have uh, two self-driving stacks, which run exactly the same software. And as long as that like agrees with each other, they think, okay, well, then at least we uh, nothing in our software in one of the computers just is suddenly corrupt. Um, but there's also companies which have, for example, uh, two self-driving stacks and uh, one is using traditional methods uh, and the other is then maybe using like deep neural networks. And then as long as they agree with each other, they know, okay, well, I guess this path is safe and good. Uh, but yeah, as soon as they start disagreeing, you uh, you have to think about, okay, well, what's, what's, uh, what's uh, software is probably right or what software is probably doing uh, making good decision um, i think the, we have also oh, some oh, comments oh. in the chat sorry yeah oh. go on uh, yeah, yeah just just wondering it's also hard in some cases of course to even define what is the right way to solve some 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 situation okay not killing people and being safe is most obvious but you know is a is there, there's of course the, the 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 trolley problem. It does it really apply? Is that something that's actually considered this type of thing? Is or should it just slam on the brakes and make it a good? Um, try to avoid any issue whatsoever. And then, I mean, is that is that even a thing that is being? Uh, is it still relevant? This kind of uh, situations or questions is are they being considered or is that I'm just blabbering. Yeah, I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting thing. So actually, I was asking this yesterday um, to a couple of people at a, at a university. Um, and there someone just said, okay, well, let's uh, appoint someone in the, in the country. You know, I have a committee that says, okay, if the car sees this, you have to respond in it in this way. Uh, so basically, he said, okay, well, let's solve the trolley problem by just appointing someone who is then responsible for uh, for solving it. Uh, 
and then you have a set of test cases where the car has to make the right ethical decision or have to, has to make the right decision. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'll edit here. Uh, I don't know how much of a, of a thing it is. So the problem is that uh, normally you try to keep the car safe in all situations, right? So you don't uh, hope that you're ending up in one of these situations. But if you, for example, there are situations where it's really hard for the car to um, to really not get into an accident because if it gets surrounded by four cars, yeah, then you while driving, then you can't go anywhere without hitting a car. And if one of the cars breaks, yeah. You you can't make a make a you can only like take the path of the least damage but not not a path of no damage. Um, yeah, I see by the way a couple of uh, comments in the chat. Uh, maybe do you can you uh, or can someone summarize them or? Uh, I can add a comment about the uh, the paper that I linked. Ah. Um, so I I definitely don't know much of anything about certifiability, but I do know that uh, uh, so Luca Carloni is the uh, the author on the paper that I linked, and uh, so he's a professor at MIT. Um, I've seen him uh, give a presentation on some subject that was closely related to this one, and uh, and so he's always talking about certifiability, and this is something that they're very clearly working on. Um, so as soon as you mentioned it, that was the first place where my where my mind went. And um, so just while we were sitting here, I quickly searched through my archive of uh, his papers and found one of the ones that uh, makes certifiability a, an explicit point. And so that was the one that I linked here. Um, uh, so in that paper, uh, I have this up on my screen right now, uh, Appendix A on page 21 um, is where they go into uh, defining uh, what they consider to be the criteria for um, for certifiability and the justifications and the ref references that they have of uh, you know prior work and so on in this area, and what so what they're doing is they're looking for um, uh, some kind of provable algorithm that uh, is either able to give an answer that it can prove is correct or give an answer saying I don't know. Uh, and, you know, because it's just undecidable in the amount of time that was given or the algorithms that are given or whatever. Um, so uh, so they're, they're looking for something that comes out with a deterministic answer, even though, you know, we, we understand that the problem is unbounded and the problem is not a deterministic problem. Um, but you can deterministically come out with an answer that says, I don't know in the situations where I don't know. Yeah. What, what should a car do if it doesn't know? That's a really good question. So uh, I think that touches on the, the ethics question. So I took uh, a class specifically on AI and robotic uh, ethics with uh, Matthias Scheutz uh, from Tufts. And um, uh, long story short there, uh, you can't just do nothing because lots of times yeah. doing, doing nothing is the unethical choice. And, and also you're on the highway at that moment, right? So you're driving really fast. And... <laughs> yeah, so, so you can't just do nothing. Um, and I'm trying to remember this class was a few years ago now and it was just one class. Um, but uh, we had the conclusion that we all reached in, was that you have to have an uh, explicit ethical uh, decision-making sy system and that it has to be a hybrid, that you try to make these deterministic choices if you can. And whenever you can't make a deterministic choice, then you have to rely on something that is less precise, which may be a, um, I, th I think we were concluding that the, what seemed like the best non-deterministic uh, uh, um, agent was something that was uh, cooperative inverse uh, reinforcement learning, CIRL. Um, and, uh, you know, so you train an agent um, with an expert uh, in these edge cases in advance, and then whatever you're able to train into it, that's what it has to go on at the time when something uncontrolled is happening. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it won't always be right, but neither will a human. Maybe maybe one, uh, one other proposal is to, to try to have the car always plan a safe path. Uh, before making a uh, uh, planning for the next uh, for the next thing, to know, okay, well, if there is a problem arising in the next uh, uh, court frame or in the next second, then I will at least be able to, for example, park on the side of the highway, or at least uh, whatever happens after this decision, I will always be able to uh, to come to a safe stop. 
So I will uh, just add um, add a, a safe safe path. Uh, so where you have kind of maybe a more traditional classical planner, they just say, okay, well, what's what's the worst that can happen? At least I will try to come to a safe stop and make sure they always have a safe path to go um, option in your car. Maybe so one thing. Yeah, great. So I quickly want to look at, uh, I also see that uh, Ignat Georgiev had, uh, had a couple of suggestions in the chat. Uh, so I think he... Yeah, well we have actually more um, but uh, do you want me to read them or I, yeah i can actually summarize this if uh, you can hear me that's my command uh, it's vignesh here so i would just uh, put them all in one shot point like um, it would more or less second the comment from loy van beek with regards to the aeroplane industry so since we are already talking about a uh, highly developed autonomous vehicle kind of a concept or a, a technology here uh, we can probably make uh, use of the uh, or exploit the advantages that's already available in aircraft industry, such as a black box, which would record in case of uncertain scenarios. So since we are dealing with, um, you know, something that's out of your control and uh, such uh, devices can help us to understand the critical or the corner cases um, that can be recorded and uh, what evasive actions from the user is usually done and which is a uh, a good evasive action and which is a critical or a lethal or unavoidable uh, evasive actions that's being carried out from a driver point of view, because ultimately what we might try to match is um, the safety of the uh, the driver as well as the, uh, the, I mean to say the ego as well as the other counter vehicle or pedestrians um, in that particular scene or incident whatsoever. So uh, this can get, help us uh, achieve at a more realistic uh, inference of the situation. And of course, we don't have to always um, look for the best case scenarios because what we are trying to achieve is the development of the technology and what we might look forward is towards addressing the corner cases or what can be really be bad. And um, so, uh, the, you don't have to really, you know, reinvent the wheel of trying to find some new standards. But uh, uh, when you have such a device which can give you the input of um, the reactions from the driver or uh, whatever um, things can be locked in that particular incident, it, it's going to be a uh, good information for us because end of the day, this particular data would be really precious for us to observe that. And secondly, um, since we are talking about self-driving, now we, we are talking about uh, all the neural networks and stuff and uh, to bring it into productions or make it realistic, there uh, there are still a lot of steps that needs to be understood. Unlike um, you have the ESP or an ABS, that's more or less an algorithm based kind of an information. But here on the deep learning front, we do not really have that understanding or or, a good grip as that of um, an ABS or an ESP technology. And um, so, so a standard or a certification or a safety point with regards to the neural networks would be a important backbone that I feel, uh, uh, which will be needed to uh, to understand and go towards a safety certification point of view for a self-driving car. So something like right now we are pushing towards an explainable AI. That's like the trend that would be making sense in a similar fashion. We would have to look at it um, for the networks that are being dealt in self-driving cars. Yeah, uh, that you better know uh, what is this algorithm actually doing or what it's actually thinking or what what, is, what can it actually detect. That's what you're saying, that if you have a deep neural network in there, you should, if before you let this car on the road, you should also kind of show, oh, this is actually what the network learned or this is what it, uh, what it shows. Uh, yeah, pretty much like a cognitive intelligence that we as humans have, something that can be interpreted by the network. So when we try to understand what behavior that it can give uh, should be correlatable by us as well. For an, a scenario A, this is what a collective information from a human uh, or a person as a human would give. And does the network also have uh, such um, you know, reactions or output behaviors and that that's basically is going to give us an understanding about how the network would behave. So it's just as uh, seconding your point that was understanding how the network would behave basically. Yeah. 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 yeah it's an interesting one. Um, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, then maybe uh, so we have we've had 
one more chat, right? So, so that was you, right, Vignesh? Uh, like you can't see. Uh... Yes, that's me. That's me. Uh, so my points are pretty much summarized, and I don't yeah. have any further questions. Uh, let me also write down your uh, your using using uh, NCAP tests. Uh, as I said, really cool. and then we had Ignat uh, who said, "Okay, well, let's have an operation design domain." Uh, for example, daytime, uh, nighttime. So just make sure that you uh, can drive under certain certain circumstances, and then uh, have people or have your cars only drive then and there, uh, which I think is nice. I summarize it here. Um, and he also says, okay, have more granular criteria for success rather than just say, oh, we didn't crash, uh, which is maybe the statistical way. Uh, that's maybe also a thing for the statistical way that uh, we already saw that uh, human controlled driving is remarkably safe, right? So uh, if there's only one, uh, one deathly crash every uh, 114 years of driving, the statistical verification is really hard to do. Uh, and I actually think it's interesting that for humans, uh, you base the decision whether a human is allowed to go on the road uh, on a 20 minute or like a, maybe an hour driving test where a driving instructor sits next to you. So if you can manage to not cause an accident uh, for an hour, that apparently is enough proof for our current country that uh, you will probably not make a, <laughs> make an, uh, have an accident for the rest of your life. Um, Maybe something else which is interesting about the both the, maybe the statistical way um, is uh, what happens if you do a software update, right? So if you, for example, look at the driving test I mentioned, uh, or yeah, maybe another, another comment, if, if you want to do this in a statistical way for humans, uh, then actually you should have a driving test which, uh, which lasts like uh, 114 years. <laughs> So you would have to do a really long driving test. Uh, I think it's a nice proposal. Um, but so if you want to do it in a statistical way, what do you do if there's a software update? Because if I'm uh, deploying my car and uh, of course you'll get into new situations since you have a software update at some point, um, what do you do with it then? Do you have to, uh, do you just say, okay, well, we saw that you're safer in this one fleet. Uh, it's okay forever now, or do you, uh, also have uh, have like uh, all the other things like your redundancy in hardware and software. Uh, do you have your automotive coding standards up to date? Doesn't mean you can just deploy new software or do you have to go through the same statistical verification again? Um, there's always interesting uh, question. Yeah, there's indeed, um, with, there's uh, kind of things like uh, ISO 262. Um, let me also write that down. So that's really for the coding side, uh, ISO 26262. Uh, there's also the safety of the intended functionality. So there's also, um, there's also an other new ISO standards that people are working on. Um, so there are some practices uh, which you can use, um, which is really interesting. Anyways, I will go on with the presentation and maybe after the meetup, we can have a bit of a longer discussion if people want, if they like this. Uh, I at least really enjoy talking about this. Uh, I think all the suggestions are great. Um, but yeah, anyways, so I one way of doing it or one thing which people suggested is uh, proof that handles students have test cases, right? Or um, prove that it uh, makes certain decisions correct. Uh, I think that uh, or it starts with kind of data sets. So if you look at public data sets, um, self-driving has already has a big history of self-driving open data sets like the Kitty data sets, which is already uh, pretty old Cityscapes data set, which is still being used a lot uh, today. Uh, there's Mavlary Vistas, which is still interesting nowadays. Um, and in the last couple of years, there have been many big, massive data sets added for autonomous driving. So you've got, uh, for example, the Berkeley Deep Drive data set, which is really nice. Uh, there's the Lyft and Cementa Kitty and Waymo data set, which all have loads of bounding boxes and loads of uh, situations you can train your uh, algorithm on. But one thing which is uh, um, one, maybe a problem for the statistical validation and the whole validation of self-driving cars on its own is the fact that data sets are uh, not really balanced. 
So if you just look at, uh, I think this is for the new scenes, uh, counted the points for each class in semantic segmentation, you can see that uh, loads of LiDAR points hit drive board surface, right? And there's loads of LiDAR points which hit a car. So this kills logarithmic. Uh, so you can see that, for example, there's um, already uh, more than 10 times the amount of LiDAR points hitting cars than uh, hitting adults on the road. So it's not that weird if an, uh, so traditionally machine learning algorithms uh, are kind of learning the underlying distribution of data and the classes which you are training on are really important uh, to have those kind of be the same. So it's not that weird that it's harder to detect pedestrians than detect cars. And if we go uh, further, you can see that it's already there's then 10 times the amount of points hitting a pedestrian than hitting a bicycle. So bicycles are uh, already will already be harder to detect and uh, uh, and see than uh, than others if you don't do your data sampling correctly. And yeah, children uh, are then uh, more than 10 times as uh, unlikely to spot as bicycles. So if you are just naively training in your network on uh, whatever data you're just randomly selecting, uh, yeah, you're gonna have a bad time uh, <laughs> to say it in South Park way. Um, and not only is present important, but the context in which an object occurs is also important. So uh, how often do you, for example, see a jaywalker on the street? So maybe your algorithm could have a kind of a prejudice against saying, oh, this person is, uh, this is a set of points on the sidewalk, or this is probably a jaywalker. Oh, this is a set of points uh, above a big flat surface, or this is probably a car. Um, and then maybe how often do you see a child with an animal jaywalking? So all these things are situations which are occurring on a daily basis. Um, but it's really important that your data set covers it. So one question one should ask if one is developing a self-driving car is, hey, how well does your data cover your operational design domain? Do you really indeed cover all these situations? Do you cover, for example, day and night? Do you cover a highway and inner city? Um, and that makes collecting and annotating data one of the bigger problems, I think, for now making autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, or to say it as uh, Andre Kapati, who is the director of uh, AI at Tesla, uh, your machine learning model is basically a compressed and compiled version of your data set. So uh, having a high quality data set, uh, which is also balanced, um, that basically drives both your perception performance and your safety case. So in this case, it's also important that, for example, the precision with which you annotate drives the precision of your model and uh, the precision with which you annotate your uh, vehicles also drive the precision with which you can validate, right? So if you, for example, are annotating uh, your bounding boxes with untrained annotators who are just, oh, there's a car, there's a car there, that, uh, that means that you can't say anymore if your algorithm A is better than algorithm B, if your accuracy is not up to, uh, I don't know, uh, like if you're, if you're annotating your uh, data with maybe an accuracy of half a meter, then you can't have an algorithm which is, or you can't validate that your algorithm is more accurate than half a meter. And also the consistency with which you annotate your data drives the certainty of the model and your validation metrics. So if you would have a, um, if you want to see if you're really detecting all the cars as cars and all the pedestrians as pedestrians, um, or maybe you have more edge cases where you're defining when something is a child or when something is an adult, uh, all those things are really important to get across to all your annotators. Um, and also those people have to abide the guidelines really well as it's the basics of your uh, performance calculations. So these are things which I'm uh, thinking a lot about on a daily basis. Um, and one maybe fun experiment to quickly share uh, is that we took a lot of highway data, uh, LiDAR data, and we annotated it twice. So that's not something you normally see in a data set because people just want to get uh, more and more situations rather than the same data for the same, uh, <laughs> for the same uh, boring stretch of highway. But uh, what we did is we asked uh, annotators, okay, how big do you think this car is? How wide do you think this car is based on this LiDAR data? And also let me know if it's uh, maybe a bit occluded. So let me know if you can really make a decision or not. And we matched, uh, we matched, matched situations. 
Um, you can already see that, uh, for example, for the width of the vehicle uh, on the highway, you see loads of vehicles from behind. So there, all the annotators kind of agree um, up to maybe a couple of centimeters accuracy how wide cars are, uh, which is amazing. And they do it better if they if objects are not included. And also for the height, uh, objects are really easy to estimate uh, in LiDAR. There, people really agree with each other. Um, you can see that if you are looking at the center points, uh, people already tend to agree maybe a bit less, uh, especially for uh, the um, occluded vehicles. It's, uh, it's a bit uh, harder to estimate where exactly the center is if you don't know exactly how long a vehicle is. And also for the length of the vehicle, in LiDAR you can't, if you see an object from behind, you can't really say how long it is. And you can see that uh, we also see that the accuracy then maybe drops where everyone agrees up to like 50 centimeters how long and uh, how long a car is uh, but it's not this clear oh it's five five or ten centimeters accurate uh, but it also means that if you're evaluating an algorithm on this uh, training data you can't say anymore oh this algorithm is good or bad if it's uh, performing um, like you can only kind of compare this algorithm to the same annotated or annotated data twice to see if your algorithm is at human-like precision or not. Um, so yeah, and then maybe the last thing, which I think is interesting uh, about kind of the data labeling or annotation business, um, is that AI will need to adapt to new situations, right? So we often think about, oh, let's just build a, build a robot and release it in the world and we'll kind of just keep doing its task. But especially uh, for robot taxis, the world will keep changing and there's an infinite amount of edge cases. So here in Germany, uh, already two years ago, we got those uh, e-scooters um, and they were not allowed to drive on the pavement. So they had to drive on the road. Uh, <laughs> so you can guess uh, who was uh, driving our recording vehicle uh, that day uh, to catch all the situations because suddenly uh, like the tiny thin uh, objects, which were normally classified as pedestrians, were going at uh, 20 or 30 kilometers an hour over the roads. Uh, but yeah, so those, this is that's like a real life case of uh, which I guess is maybe pretty solvable because we knew this and we could take our recording vehicle and drive around and collect way more information and way more data and quickly label that. Uh, but there's also edge cases which you are uh, never really seeing. Like if there's a plane landing, uh, you and I, you know, we all know. Uh, this is uh, that's bad news if you see it in front of you. So you keep loads of distance, but for your self-driving car, they never see this, or they maybe the entire fleet sees this only once. And it's really important that you're able to uh, handle this. Um, and maybe also the human brain is quick to adapt. So this is a snapshot from a video where this car is on fire, and it's um, at some point the brakes break, so it comes burning down this hill. And uh, even though normally, uh, if you if this was a view from a self-driving car, um, you would think, oh, uh, it is my right of way. <laughs> but we as a human know that uh, this car, which is on fire and coming down the hill, is not going to give you a right of way. Uh, so our, like as a human, we are kind of making loads of assumptions. Um, and a self-driving car fleet should also be able to handle unknown objects and other situations. Um, so yeah, traffic changes over time. Think about those uh, e-scooters finally some, or sometimes suddenly popping up. And I think an AI fleet should learn fast from new situations because new situations will pop up on a daily basis. So your uh, AI or your loop from observing a new weird or interesting situation to deploying a model should be as short as possible. So if you perceive a new object, you should be able to label it super quickly, uh, retrain your model with new data, uh, verify the performance of your model. We talked about that before, right? That you make sure that everything is still uh, okay, that maybe your explainable AI, uh, someone suggested that uh, still has the right explainability and then you can deploy it. Um, and make sure that you take temporal effects from maybe hourly uh, effects uh, to maybe seasonal or yearly. So maybe in winter, less people are using e-scooters in the summer. Make sure that you all take this into account when selecting training and validation data. Um, so yeah, we went over the levels of uh, driving automations. We went over the sensors. We went over an architecture of how you can go to actuation. 
we uh, went over some over a couple of methods and we had a discussion on what safety verification you would like to see uh, the need for a balanced data set and new to, new, the need to adapt to new situations. So if people have questions or want to continue a discussion, uh, let me know. I already see one hand raised. Yeah, I think you can unmute yourself. Uh, it's pos it should be possible. So just go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you for your time. Um, so I've just also popped in the question just in case uh, people are not able to capture that. So right now we see a lot of data sets coming up from both corporates as well as on the research front, uh, like Waymo, Kitty or Aptiv, and even uh, as old as uh, Oxford data set and things like that. Um, being an active, you know, um, person who's interested in these topics, uh, I find that when you move across one particular data set to the other, there is no particular standard that's being carried out um, in, in different levels. I completely agree that the sensor usage or the, the count of the sensors can be different, but um, in terms of uh, the ground fundamental understanding, if it's a camera image, for example, and if you're doing uh, or generating data sets for a 2D object detection, then the formatting or the annotation sc uh, scheme is not universal across different places. And this, um, I personally feel that takes in a lot of time to first get the understanding of how, what and how the data set is being generated. And a lot of time can go into understanding about the data set in itself. And also the next point would be how better can we exploit that for uh, any use case on a research front or any other topic. So um, is there any developments on that front to standardize or make it like a universal guideline that on generating data sets, which can make things simpler for use of yeah. people? I think there's one, one standard. I don't know a lot about it, but there's at least the uh, open label, uh, label uh, standard, I think, which is trying to make sure that at least people have the same kind of annotation schema for another style. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one inherent problem is that um, is the labels you choose are really important, right? So if you look at uh, here, the labels which Nusins uses. Mm -hmm. Can you say it? Yeah. Yes. They, they have, for example, a difference between a car and a truck uh, and a trailer and a bus and a construction vehicle. Um, so those are all, and a police car and, uh, and an ambulance. So those are all different kinds of vehicles. So one basically has to make a hierarchy of, okay, well, these are the high level classes and then there's the subclasses. So if someone proposes that and everyone can go with it and can agree with it, I think that's fine. But until then, right now, basically, it's just uh, every company has their own idea of what they find important. Uh, and especially if you are thinking that, for example, a robo uh, taxi might have a big need to recognize an ambulance, but maybe another uh, vehicle uh, doesn't have this problem or doesn't feel this need or just has it in a different data set. So why pay for annotating this if you don't need it or don't want it? Um, same for, I don't know, maybe you want to know exactly whether it's a stroller or, uh, or something else. Um, like you can make this, uh, you can make this labeling specification uh, super long and have a thousand different edge cases for annotators. Or you can uh, make it really short and just say, okay, annotate everything which is drivable uh, <laughs> or has, a, has an engine as one, uh, one class. Uh, yeah. So different data sets have different, uh, different, uh, different things. I know that there's one for semantic segmentation. I think um, for IROS last year, uh, some there was a paper, I forgot the name, uh, mm -hmm. but they basically took loads of semantic segmentation data sets, um, used a way to make, a new, make new hierarchies across all these uh, annotations, and then trained one big neural network on all these data sets at the same time. And that yielded super amazing results where you could recognize indoor scenes, outdoor scenes, all kinds of, uh, kind of things. So if someone uh, does that for self-driving cars, that would be amazing. Uh, that would be really cool. Uh, so can you probably uh, share a link or if there's a paper or something, if you remember later maybe? 
If I find it, okay, I will, uh, I will uh, send it. Um, but yeah, send me a message on LinkedIn. So I will try to, I will try to search for it. Mm-hmm. It's okay. a bit hard to search for it because the only thing I remember, if not, someone else in this chat, by the way, knows it, I mostly remember that they had a uh, video of people making loads of backflips and the neural network was recognizing that. If people now think, oh yeah, there's one paper where they had a video with loads of backflips, uh, that, that's the one. Okay. Uh, Send me a message on LinkedIn. I will find it for you. Sure. Uh, one last question. I wouldn't wind it up with that. So uh, everybody or uh, the industry is now driving towards um, developing autonomous vehicles. But then on the other side, uh, is there any foresight towards developing the infrastructure that can make it more realizable? Because just the last point that we discussed um, with the edge cases and other topics, a uh, very simple example of uh, the e-scooter that's being driven on the road or any other parking-based scenarios that can differ from country to country or globally. So um, is, my, my question is like an open-ended, like is there a future towards developing the infrastructure that can also go in uh, speeding up the uh, realization of autonomous vehicle or would it be a demand on the, development of autonomous vehicle being uh, ready to, you know, adapt to any situations, like which yeah. one is a proper trade-off? Yeah, good question. So I actually won a hackathon in 2017 uh, for coming up with proposals for the for local government to improve their infrastructure for self-driving cars. Uh, so that was cool. Um, but so, so you can see that even like smaller, smaller governments are thinking about, okay, what, what do we want to uh, do? And in the Netherlands, for example, there's already loads of, yeah, they call it uh, intelligent, for uh, safe installations, intelligent intersections, um, where they are, uh, like, over the internet, you can already get the traffic light information. So you know if your self-driving car can drive or not. Uh, so other countries are maybe lagging a bit behind that. If you look at, for example, Pony AI, who is operating in China, they just made a deal with the local Chinese government. Uh, I think that the government in China is way more lenient towards, oh, well, let's just do this uh, because it gives us uh, lots of economic benefits um, towards uh, putting LIDARs, for example, on intersections so that in really difficult traffic situations, you can just rely on the intersection to give you information your self-driving car needs. So you need to have a less impressive perception stack. You basically have an extra sensor or an extra source of information. Um, for where objects are and where they're going and what's, uh, what they are allowed to do. Uh, I think one big problem is that uh, in other countries, maybe you're not willing to wait that long uh, or wait or yeah, be dependent on the government to change all the infrastructure. So I think that loads of self-driving car companies still want to solve the problem without a need to adapt infrastructure, uh, simply because you have to solve this problem anyways if you want to expand globally. Uh, see you, Edward. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, so yeah, if you have to solve the problem anyways, you have to solve it anyways. Um, so yeah, it is definitely, infrastructure is definitely a point, but um, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, uh, it makes sense, like not every government across different countries would be ready and would have the, uh, the technology at hand to do that. Uh, so, okay, then pretty much that's it. Thank you very much for your answers. No problem. I actually have some questions. Uh, do you have you seen uh, many people using event cameras? Oh yeah, uh, event cameras are really time. interesting. Uh, I really, I think especially the Vidis is uh, posting them always on his LinkedIn, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I always see his videos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know if any. Um, a serious self-driving car company has them on their um, on their vehicle already. I haven't mm-hmm. seen any specific open self-driving car data sets with event, event cameras. But yeah, they look really mm-hmm. interesting, especially in combination with like spiking neural networks. Uh, it could be a it could be a big thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering how they would handle rain, but. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get someone uh, working with event cameras to do a meetup. I think it would be super interesting. I, I would love to uh, um, to play around with it for a, for a couple of weeks. Uh, so if someone has like a spare one, let me know. 
I think they cost at least three k at least uh, when I looked into them about two years ago. Um, so not not terrible compared to lighters. Um, yeah. Yeah. Another another question I have is: uh, Do you happen to know Michael Decord? Yeah. Um, and I think he's pushing a simulator. Uh, so he's developing a simulator and he's arguing that uh, most of the self-driving uh, stacks are done uh, in the wrong way. Uh, yeah. Simulation stack because you run everything in a single process and instead everything should be decoupled. So every process should be decoupled and then uh, your simulation should work in uh, such a way. Uh, but I don't think I fully grasp it. So I'm wondering, what do you think about this? If you know what this is about? Yeah, well, so the first thing is maybe that Michael is always a person who on LinkedIn is really pessimistic about, he, he is always writing uh, medium articles about everything self driving car companies are doing is wrong, uh, <laughs> which I think is an interesting premise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But and he's always pushing for okay, there needs to be better from the ground up validation. And he's probably a bit right in that sense that there needs to be a really thorough validation, which is something which is harder to find or which self driving cars car companies are less open about. So even if mm. you look at uh, the safety reports, kind of every self driving car company has a safety report now of like 100 pages. And I think one justified critique of Michael is that the safety report is both something to sell your company as well as put your safety case in. And there's a lot of selling in those reports and maybe not enough safety case. So something which you can't find uh, mm -hmm. is um, what is the effective range of your LiDAR? What kind of, uh, uh, what kind of objects do you have a problem with? Um, or what is the effective, uh, like what, what are your specific neural network metrics? You know, what's your confusion matrix? Uh, what objects do you have a problem with? Um, what kind of objects can you not handle? Uh, so yeah, in that sense, I totally see what Michael is saying that there, uh, there might be a need for like a different way of validating things. Um, I don't know exactly what the thing he's doing with the simulation. I haven't really read into that. So I should maybe do that. Uh, um, but I think he's more for doing things a traditional automotive way where you just say, okay, well, these, these are the specific specs of my algorithm. So I can do like a formal proof that my algorithm or my self-driving car planner is always able to react to those uh, things. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious uh, what he can yeah, where he can get with his ideas. I yeah, think it's, yeah. uh, it could be useful, but uh, I'm not in the industry at all. So I was wondering what, uh, what you were thinking about this. Yeah, I, I've read some articles from him and I think he has a, a right, uh, right critique points, um, which could be addressed. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm personally, I mean, I'm personally trying to get the, or make safety cool again <laughs> by just having a discussion, like an open discussion with people mm -hmm. like, okay, what's, what would you like to see? And I always see that people are really engaged in, uh, in doing that and have great ideas. And uh, Michael is more pushing towards, okay, just th this is the way you should do it. Come on guys, uh, get, get with the program. <laughs> but yeah, there's, mm -hmm. there's a couple of people who are trying to yeah. uh, make safety cool or make safety relevant. And uh, yeah, it's always interesting to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Now's the moment. Doesn't seem, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it. Um, okay, then I think uh, I think we can. Oh, Vinesh unmuted. I saw it. Yeah, actually, uh, so I just didn't want to push because we are well beyond the time limit. Uh, on a very general note, uh, how how do you see the um, EU's development towards or? Uh, I would like to probably put it in a fashion that um, the, the so-called competition between the uh, the American 
uh, technology development towards autonomous driving and the European style of development towards autonomous uh, driving systems. Because right now we have Zooks um, and Waymo and uh, also different other players um, in, in the American market, uh, but in the European market, uh, I mean, of course, Tesla, uh, but on the European market, we are in the verge of, uh, I would say, sto- slow, steady, and also at a standard level. Uh, probably that's how the, uh, the cultural way point of uh, development is, at least within European countries. And um, would it be, again, a ground up technology development or would it be like um, uh, re-engineering of what the, uh, the technology is going on at, uh, in, 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 for example, in America? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, in terms of geography, uh, in Munich, we had a couple of self-driving car companies, right? So we had, uh, we had AID, which is now part of Argo. So Argo has a European headquarters, which is really nice. So at least they are going to test uh, things here in uh, Munich and Hamburg. Um, so there is there are some developments towards also getting uh, cars and roads here. Um, we also had a lift level five office here in Munich a while ago, uh, but I think they now stopped. Um, but so there is there is some development uh, going on in Europe. No, no, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I'm not saying that there's no development. Like uh, I'm just talking about the pace of the development. For example, uh, right now we have the uh, shuttles from ZF get to there uh, in Germany. That's also uh, in pipeline and a lot of um, taxis, for example, shuttle taxis from different companies uh, uh, in Berlin or Hamburg, for example, where yeah. you have, yeah. So, I mean, I completely agree to the development on that point, but I'm just trying to understand, is, would there be any kind of uh, a lead who wants to be the pioneer or do you see something like that? Or would it be like uh, more of a cooperational development that would happen? Like yeah. I said, it was our general point and not uh, specific on the topic that we're discussing. Yeah, maybe one uh, one other. Uh, I mean, I'm now I'm just going to give loads of opinions on on things, right? But uh, so maybe one other thing which might play play a bit of a role is that in America you can self certify um, vehicles, so you can basically deploy something and then you're responsible for whatever happens to it, uh, but you don't have to show upfront what uh, that your vehicle is safe to go on the road. Whereas uh, in Europe, we have the TEF uh, in Germany and the LEV uh, in the Netherlands who are all assessing uh, vehicles before they are allowed to go onto the road. So that's also different. So you see that in uh, London, for example, there's already a bit more self-driving car companies because there you can just, as long as you're in the driver's seat and safety driver, you're, uh, you're responsible. Um, Whereas with AD, we always had uh, we had to spend a lot of time to get our car approved to go on the road with a safety driver. So in America, it might be easier to start a self-driving car company. And then there's of course also loads of um, knowledge already in uh, in America, loads of maybe more money, uh, which could play a role. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some interesting European players. Uh, um, but those those might be uh, those might be a couple of reasons that uh, and maybe the other thing is the traditional automotive world uh, they are often relying on traditionally relying on third party vendors so now Volkswagen did make a good start by having uh, Carryat uh, that's their new uh, car software organization uh, yeah. so they are they are trying to uh, start this right so they are now setting up their own internal software development for uh, for um, self-driving functionality uh, or overall the software functionality. Uh, so it is catching up or it is, it is uh, now joining the game, um, but yeah. Perfect, thank you. Other questions? Um, yeah, hi Roland, Param here. Uh, I wanted to brief about like any more open source software developments like which could help all of them. So there are a few of them currently right now. Uh, any like I've uh, seen Apollo and AutoWare, but any more of them like uh, which could really be worth looking into or anything like that. Yeah, in terms of the open source projects, I think Apollo is really interesting because it's really a self-driving car, like a complete stack and has lots of high-level programs. 
So if you look at their uh, approaches, they, they all make uh, lots of sense and they're really interesting. Um, and that's really to bootstrap a whole uh, self-driving car taxi service. What I really like about Autoware is that they are starting from the safety case. So basically, uh, Apollo is approaching it from, oh, let's just add some functionality and then we can later see how we can certify it. And Autoware seems to go from, okay, well, let's start with the basis we can certify uh, to put in every car. And then we can see what kind of functions we can add later on top of that of the already certified stack. So that's, uh, that's a big difference. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't have any other. I mean, those are my opinions on the on the two projects you just mentioned. Uh, Comma AI is also open source, right? Uh, so there you can see what they are using. I think, um, but that's of course again level two system, um, and there are the safety certifications also. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's mostly mostly unit tests, and uh, you as a driver are always responsible. That's. Uh, that's the message. Their uh, safety uh, document is literally a readme.txt, uh, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, so there's uh, there's are a couple of open source projects. Um, Thanks, Ruben, for your views. Like that's helpful. Thank you. Cool. No more questions from my end. So, let me ask one more uh, one more question. Uh, but first, uh, thanks for the presentation. It was uh, it was nice to see. Um, so, but then let me ask the hardest questions, I guess, uh, and that is when. <laughs> yeah, good question. So, it's actually is there an answer? Uh, so I think the the biggest question is how to scale. Uh, maybe then, because uh, when is already now, because you can already uh, you can already book uh, rides with Waymo, right? So there's already level four driving in uh, very limited areas. Uh, uh, I can actually recommend. The, I, I really like watching uh, watching videos of self driving cars. It's my uh, it's my hobby. Uh, doing that day and night. Uh, but there's uh, there's loads of interesting videos from JJ Wright, who is riding a lot with Waymo. He also has a spreadsheet where you can see that over the years that he has ridden with Waymo, they are more and more completely driverless. Um, I think this morning he actually had a really terrible video where he actually had a big problem where a car like couldn't handle a construction zone, uh, but then they are quick to fix it. So now the question is, how can Waymo scale this to multiple cities? Um, how can they add more uh, streets or their ODD? How can they uh, make this a worldwide thing? Um, so things are already possible now. Uh, the question is, how can you expand your, uh, your number of streets you're driving? Uh, and did they maybe overfit to one area? Or is the problem really hard? Uh, we don't know. Thanks. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, super interesting stuff. Uh, cool. All right. So, if there are no more questions, uh, then I think uh, we can finish. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was really good. And uh, it was nice to have that discussion. I think it changed the dynamics. And we need to have more of us in the future meetups. Yeah, hopefully now people uh, know each other from the self-driving car meetup or the, the robotics meetup. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I think it's possible. Um, yeah, uh, all right, so uh, let's close. Thanks a lot and see you next time. Thank you all for joining the discussion. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed it as well and uh, see you all next time. <laughs>